Okay, so uh, thank you very much for, for having me. It's, 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 it's great to be here uh, because I attended quite a few uh, of these talks and I watched Ilyas's talk on YouTube, um, his first talk uh, last year when I was working on this. So I feel like I'm giving back to, to the biochar community who, who shared a lot of knowledge with me. So I'm, I'm Joshua Msika. I, I'm the sustainability coordinator at the James Hutton Institute. That means mainly I have an operational role in terms of reporting our climate change, uh, our carbon emissions to the Scottish government and managing the Institute's uh, environmental sustainability. But sometimes they let me out uh, and I can do a bit of research. And this, this is the project that I did uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, and uh, I, uh, so I'll be talking mainly about uh, the results that are presented in a full text report that's available at the link there. You can look up more information about the James Hutton Institute. We're an agricultural and environmental research institute uh, with about 500 staff, 400 scientists uh, working mainly for the Scottish government, UK government and on EU projects as well as commercial projects, um, all to do with the climate emergency, the biodiversity crisis and other such uh, challenges. So um, let's just see if I can move the slides on. So today I briefly, I'll briefly talk about our um, new project, uh, the Glensoch Climate Positive Research Farm. Uh, I'll briefly talk about my project, which was looking at integrated approaches to biomass energy and kind of the problem that I was trying to solve. Uh, and then I'll, I'll move quickly on into the key findings of my report, which I have to say is a literature review. I didn't do any original research. I've, what I've done here is I've tried to synthesize a lot of other people's work, including Elias's work, including probably the work of many others here. Uh, and so it's very much presented for peer review. It hasn't been peer reviewed. My report is just a, a kind of grey literature report. Um, but I'd love to hear from you if I've missed anything. So um, briefly, um, one slide on our, uh, the James Hutton Institute's Klensoch Climate Positive Research Farm Project. Um, we have a 1,000 uh, acre uh, research farm based in the northeast of Scotland here. Um, and uh, we it's it's an upland farm so it's it's a kind of extensive grazing managed grasslands unmanaged grasslands uh woodland uh, uh renewable energy and we're using that farm we want to use that farm as a platform to tackle the climate and biodiversity crises with transformative farming technological in, innovations and um, so the aim is really to combine cutting-edge research new technologies and obviously kind of public outreach and and we're open to partnership there um, including on the topic of, of biochar if anyone's interested so my project was really a kind of seed corn project uh, within this wider umbrella of thinking about oh could we use pyrolysis and biochar as, a, as an energy solution in, in upland farms like, like this one. Um, so here's the problem framing. So we've got uh, the conventional view of, of biomass energy, and I think it's quite problematic. You can, you can see the kind of basic assumption is that um, living plants draw carbon down from the atmosphere uh, through photosynthesis, we then harvest those plants um, and uh, and combust them, and and we get energy, uh, and it just goes back up into the atmosphere. and And the the assumption in a lot of carbon accounting frameworks is that that's uh, a carbon neutral process. Um, so the um, the problem with that obviously is 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 the soil you know it, it ignores what's going on in the soil so um it, oh these slides are moving on without me saying anything anyway um so what we should have in a normal ecosystem is uh is that the uh, plant litter fall and the root exudates are actually feeding the soil food web which then uh and then the carbon returns to the atmosphere through soil respiration so um, 
the the key thing there is that there's a there's a feedback loop between the health of the soil food web and the amount of photosynthesis that happens and that that's a virtual cycle a virtuous cycle of carbon drawdown uh, and the problem is that if you then um harvest the plants and combust them for for energy and produce ash effectively you're doing nothing to feed the soil food web um, and as the uh, soil health degrades, you get less photosynthesis and you weaken that atmospheric carbon pump. Um, and that requires additional inputs of energy to, to maintain the, the disease fighting functions and fertilizing functions of the, of the soil food web, um, which kind of counterbalances or cancels out the original energy benefit. So, um, in, in, that's the problem framing. So I was thinking about, okay, that's the problem. What are the solutions? So integrated approaches to biomass energy would con explicitly consider what is returned to the soil to support future photosynthesis. So I did a quick kind of review or overview of the different types of technologies. Um, and you can see pyrolysis biochar is the fourth row down, and that's why we're all here today. But just thinking about what these different biomass technologies are actually returning to the soil. So that's it's combustion returns ash, biodiesel returns oil seed cake, anaerobic digestion returns digestate products, compost heat returns compost. Um, and you can see there are different contributions to the soil food web in terms of whether they're providing minerals or nutrients, whether they're providing carbs or sugars, and whether they're providing uh, any kind of structure to the soil or whether it's just uh, a liquid or a chemical. So, uh, and that, this is the, dis the point at which I decided to, to focus on biochar in, in my review. So this is the, the kind of brainstorm original kind of overview that I produced of the, of the applications to biochar to the, to the agricultural environment, especially in upland agriculture. And you can see that all of these benefits are, are, are kind of, should be relatively familiar to, to, to many of us here. Um, you, you burn the wood gas that provides heat and can replace fossil fuel boilers. The biochar itself is a stable form of carbon with questions about its stability as Elias pointed out. Um, you can apply the biochar to soils that has liming and fertilizing effects which can replace artificial fertilizers liming agents. And then down there you can improve water and nutrient retention and general soil health in general which can, could improve plant productivity. So those are the kind of four climate benefits uh, in addition, you can you can use biochar in compost making, anaerobic digestion, silage making, manure management, all those kind of fermentation processes, and then still use it as a soil additive. So this was kind of the starting point because uh, at this point you need to go to the literature and think, okay, to what extent are these actual benefits? How much benefit actually comes out of them? So that's that's what my report tried to address. Um, uh, so, as I said, the report's available. Um, it's a it's a relatively short report designed as a as a kind of conversation starter and to kind of set out a research field, not as the be all end all definitive answer. So. Um, these are the different sections. I looked at the climate impacts of, of, of biochar and pyrolysis. I looked at the agricultural impacts of, uh, and then I considered the practical considerations and uh, the apl applicability to the Scottish uplands. Uh, so this is it, it, so pyrolysis is the first area I looked at, um, and this graph I think is is really key. It's it's kind of my distillation of a really good uh, green carbon webinar by Hugh McLaughlin, uh, who presented in this series back in 2020, and I would really recommend his his um, his presentation because it really brought home to me that there are trade offs. Uh, uh, you know, you, you you can't have everything um, uh, when, when you're producing biochar. So, uh, and that's kind of what this graph shows is that as your process temperature increases, you're, you're sending more and more carbon out of the process. And that by definition means that your biochar yield is going down. At the same time, uh, as you're releasing that carbon, back to the atmosphere, it's oxidizing and producing heat. So you get more useful heat out of a higher temperature process. Um, 
these things may sound obvious in retrospect, but they're worth saying. The other thing that happens as you increase the temperature is that you, the volatile carbons get sent out and what's left is, is more and more um, resilient uh, and recalcitrant to, to break down in the soil. So biochar longevity in the soil increases with the process temperature. And then a really good point made by Elias in, in uh, his two papers uh, last year is, is, again, relatively obvious, but needs saying is that pyrolysis has an intrinsic energy penalty versus combustion as a heat source. So if you combust a piece of wood, you get all of the energy out of it. Whereas if you're retaining some of the carbon as biochar, you're not getting all of the energy out of it. Um, so the climate impact, again, um, depends highly on the baseline scenario. So you really need to think through what would be happening to the biomass in your pyrolysis process if it wasn't being pyrolyzed. Um, and the other thing you need to think through is how the heat would be being produced if not through pyrolysis. Um, my conclusion is the opposite to Ilyas's conclusion. It's best if pyrolysis displaces fossil fuel use. Uh, the reason for that is that he was, he, his, he's saying effectively that you should combust the biomass if you're displacing fossil fuel use, which is, which is a really interesting point and worth further discussion. Um, so next slide here. The other big thing that, that biochar does that Tony was raising is that biochar is a long-term soil carbon store. Um, but how long is a big question that a lot of research is going into. Right, and, and uh, so I've listed the factors that would affect that. This is, this is based on my literature review again. Uh, I'm not an expert, I just read things and, and reproduce them. So we've got feedstocks here. Um, if you've got a herbaceous feedstock, it's shorter lived. A woody feedstock is longer lived. Again, the production factors, pyrolysis time and the pyrolysis temperature, um, if, you, if a longer and hotter pyrolysis process produces longer lived biochar. Um, and again, uh, the soil conditions also affect uh, the, the longevity of your biochar in the soil. A more acidic, a cooler, a more anaerobic and a drier soil um, uh, conserve biochar in the soil for longer. And that you can see that drier and anaerobic um, conditions may actually be in conflict with each other. So, so it, it's, it's, not, it's not a simple, simple answer to that question. Moving then on to the ecosystem carbon cycling and, and the fact that, um, uh, that biochar has a contribution to soil health. So here's, here's, here's a, um, a simple unharvested uh, uh, ecosystem and, and its carbon flows. And what, what you can see here is that if you come in, uh, you harvest uh, and pyrolyze some biomass and turn it into biochar. Um, and uh, what that means is some of that carbon goes into biochar, obviously, and some of that carbon goes back to the, to the atmosphere immediately, rather than feeding the soil food web. Now, the hope is, obviously, that you, in adding the biochar to the soil, um, instead of adding the biomass, the raw biomass to the soil, you are having a positive contribution to soil health and that that then feeds back into a positive contribution to photosynthesis. Um, now, the relationships here are, are different, uh, so, or the, the robustness of the evidence are different. So biochar's impact on soil health is, is relatively well recognized in the literature. It increases nutrient retention, water retention, porosity, uh, cation exchange capacity, all kinds of things, um, uh, pH balancing, etc. And the effect uh, so on photosynthesis, so on that positive carbon pump, is 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 a weaker link in the literature. So so um, and the the last one, um, biochar's effect on soil respiration and greenhouse ga gas fluxes are um, relatively inconclusive. So it could go either way in terms of methane or nitrous oxide emissions, etc. So in summary, in terms of the climate impact, uh, my conclusion was that um, while biochar may have climate positive effects on 
agro-ecosystem carbon cycles, it currently seems prudent to make the case for it as a climate positive technology based on heat production and long-term soil carbon storage alone. This suggests that biochar is most climate positive when we're using woody feedstocks pyrolyzed at high temperatures to replace heat from fossil fuel boilers and applied to cooler, drier, more acidic and more anaerobic soils where it can act as a long-term carbon store. Again, this is all qualitative. I'm not putting as many numbers as Ilyas in here because those, are, those really depend on the different cases that, that you look at and uh, a life cycle analysis is really the only way of of calculating the exact climate impact of using biochar in a particular system. Moving on then to the agricultural uses of biochar. So um, th there, is, there are kind of three uh, areas of benefit that I, that I looked at. Um, so the first one was, was um, uh, biochar's liming and fertilizing effects. And this came out of reading a study by uh, Jeffrey et al. Uh, uh, really compre comprehensive meta-analysis that, that found that biochar improved crop yields in tropical soils, but not so much um, by kind of 25%, depending on, on the situation, but not so much in temperate soils. And, and the reason, according to them and according to their study, was that because these soils had low nutrients uh, and uh, a low pH, so the tropical soils. Uh, and the effects, uh, those liming and fertilizing effects, were most pronounced in herbaceous biochars based on grassy materials, which contain more ash, which has the nutrients and the, the um, liming effects. So that's really interesting because that contrasts the finding in terms of biochar stability, which is around woody biochars. So again, there are trade-offs and you can't have everything. Uh, the, the middle uh, box there is around fermentation processes. So there's, there's um, uh, biochar. Again, here, uh, more research is needed overall, but people were looking at adding biochar to composting processes, um, uh, improving manure management with it, and even using it as a kind of ruminant feed additive mixed with molasses. Um, but again, more research needed on, on that part of it. Um, and then the last thing I looked at was, was crop yields in general. Uh, and I guess the first thing to say is that the, the literature suggests that applying biochar to, to, to your crops is unlikely to have a negative effect up to 30 tons per hectare. And that's, um, that's quite a lot of biochar uh, per hectare. Um, so uh, you're, you're unlikely to cause damage. Um, but the, uh, the, the positive effects, which can occasionally be quite dramatic, um, the reasons for those aren't, still aren't fully understood. Um, and the, the kind of initial research direction suggests that it's, it's around the pretreatment before the application. So whether it's been co-composted or stored outside or exposed to the rain or whatever it is, there's something in that pretreatment that could lead to, to more consistent benefits. So re researching that, I think, is, is a key area for future research, especially in the agricultural field. The next thing that I looked at was the practical considerations of, of on-farm biochar. Um, and uh, and uh, full disclosure here, I did draw quite a lot on Ilyas's work um, and his original, pre his previous presentation uh, looking at, um, and I came to the same conclusion as he did in terms of um, the bi biomacon pyrolysis units are the most relevant for, for on-farm application um, and you can look at the table uh, so there's a photo of one there at the top right and you can look at a table here um, and you can see that uh, the there's there's small scale large scale units no heat capture heat capture um, and the the thing about the biomacon units is that they can be heat demand led so they can be responsive to the heat demand of, of the buildings that you're heating rather than the others that run a batch process and just chuck the heat out and then you have to figure out how to use it or just waste it and vent it to the atmosphere, which benefits no one. A uh, couple of other practical considerations uh, is uh, obviously the chipping and the shredding of the feedstock entails handling and cost um, and drying the, the feedstock um, 
without artificial heat, which would then reduce the net energy yield of your system. Uh, drying it naturally requires storage space and time. Uh, but the biggest challenge, uh, and Elias's most recent paper published uh, in autumn is probably the most relevant for here, is that the smallest uh, commercially available pyrolysis units are oversized for, for a temperate climate like in Scotland and do not run well on partial loads. Uh, and integrating, balancing the biochar output with the uh, heat demand of your buildings and your your available biomass is a very difficult equation to get to get right. Moving on then, uh, and uh, for my conclusion, application to the Scottish uplands. Um, so, uh, can we realise uh, biochar's potential benefits in the Scottish uplands? Uh, and here, uh, so I've taken the, the different benefits and then looked at how they apply in Scotland. So can they replace fossil fuel heat? Well, yes, uh, many Scottish farms rely on diesel, oil, propane, or kerosene for heat. So that it would, it would clearly be uh, a displacement of that heat. Um, although taking into account Ilyas's point that combustion uh, would, would displace even more of that fossil fuel heat. Um, can, can Do we have access to wood uh, to make woody biochars? Yes, many upland farms have forestry plantings or thinnings and trimmings could provide feedstock. Are we applying the biochar to cooler, drier and more acidic soils? So partly, Scottish upland soils tend to be cooler and more acidic, if not necessarily dry, as anyone who's been into the Scottish Highlands will know. Um, liming and fertilising. Is that a relevant benefit? Yes, Scottish upland soils tend to be nutrient poor and acidic, um, but uh, finding herbaceous feedstock to produce that um, biochar with a higher ash fraction may be more difficult. Uh, can we apply it to fermentation? Yes, most Scottish farms include livestock and deal with manures. Uh, they produce silage and have um, obviously room in digestion if they've, if they've got sheep or cattle. Uh, so yes, this would be a, an area of application for biochar in these Scottish uplands. Moving on to the technical challenges, um, the handling and storage obviously is a cost. Um, so for, for both the biomass, this is mainly around the biomass, not the biochar. So that's a lot smaller. Um, but handling the costs of handling and processing have to be outweighed by the agricultural benefits to be viable, unless uh, payment for carbon credits becomes possible somehow. Uh, but that requires a kind of strong market framework for, for that to happen. Uh, the other challenge is around the oversized uh, commercially available units. And again, uh, here, further technological development is necessary. Farms or farms that can make productive use of the extra heat uh, through holiday accommodation or greenhouses uh, could probably use the currently available units. So uh, my kind of closing, closing thoughts uh, based on, on my review, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, um, is that if the technical challenges can be overcome, uh, the best case would appear to be biochar from forestry wastes, pyrolyzed to optimize for high carbon stability and high heat production, so that's a high temperature process, and applied to cool acidic soils in order to boost tree or grass growth after having been co-composted with livestock manures. So that is, that's the conclusion that that is probably the most climate positive way of integrating pyrolysis and biochar into these agricultural systems. Again, only a full life cycle analysis would actually be able to confirm how, how much benefit there would be. So thank you for listening. Uh, your turn, I guess. Uh, what have I missed? Um, there's my contact email, the website for the James Hutton Institute, the website for specific website for the Glen Soch Climate Positive Farm Initiative, uh, which you can see in the photograph there, and the link to my full report. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Joshua, for your presentation. Um, very interesting to hear something about the Scottish uplands, I have to say. Uh, I can confirm that the soils are pretty wet. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, please, the uh, chat is open. 
Yeah, we are quite well over time um, overall, but uh, anyway, we have a couple of minutes. Um, so my question would be, have you checked um, about the possibility to use a manure biager? Because that's um, similar to sewage sludge, if that might be beneficial in certain farm settings. It's it's an interesting question. I haven't looked into it, but based on 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 the on the report that I've written and the reading that I've done, my my immediate reaction would be um, there's probably a lot of energy uh, input required to dry it to evaporate all the water out of it before you you can start charring it. And this is based on Hughes' presentation last year. So the the energy yield from that would would be negative you know you'd, you'd be putting more energy in than you would get out um, and then on top of that the those manures are valuable uh anyway for for um for the farmers they're 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 recycling those manures on their fields both as a as a source of nutrients but also as a source of carbon so if you're uh for to feed the soil food web if you're then pyrolyzing that carbon and driving that carbon off directly to the atmosphere and shortcutting the the soil food web i think overall in in the framing that i've used um it doesn't sound like a very positive application so you would you would have to there would have to be massive agricultural benefits to using manure biochar uh, you know there would have to be really significant benefits in order to outweigh the disadvantages that i've I've listed just now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, any more questions from the audience? Um, so Tony uh, made a um, comment, I think, um, that some of the structure begins to degrade at hotter temperatures and he found that the resulting carbon may last longer but begins to melt and lose surface area, um, which might be bad for the microbiome. Yeah, excellent point. And it's it's one thing that I forgot to say when I was on this slide. Uh, and it's the purple line, uh, Tony. So uh, that purple line uh, is, is really important as well. So you're looking at the adsorptive capacity, which, um, which increases at first, obviously, as you drive those volatile carbons off. But then as you keep heating it, the, the the carbon collapses and you and you you lose porosity and you lose that absorptive capacity which then uh, leads to reduced biological benefit when you apply it to your to your uh, ecosystem however you have to balance that against the fact that we are not a hundred percent certain so this is that's this slide that about the ability of the biochar to prime that photosynthesis pump and to actually lead to that positive virtuous cycle of, of carbon drawdown in, in your ecosystem carbon cycle. So um, if, you're, if you optimize for adsorptive capacity, you are then decreasing the energy yield so going back, you're decreasing the energy yield from, from your pyrolysis process. So you're, you're giving up some of that benefit, the energy heat benefit. You're also giving up some of the long-term soil carbon storage benefit because you're not, you're not creating as stable a biochar. And you're giving up those two benefits in order to have a relatively uncertain um uh carbon benefit here where you have to think that the counterfactual here would be to take that biomass and apply it to the soil directly or to compost it and apply it to the soil directly instead of pyrolyzing it so that was really the the whole point of of my piece of work was to look at all of these different benefits these competing benefits and to think about the fact that there's trade-offs uh, when you're when you're pyrolyzing biomass, uh, and to think about those trade-offs and to make those trade-offs explicit, so we can think about them as a community and and be open and honest about them, rather than presenting biochar as this kind of solution to every problem all at the same time. 
It's a really nice uh, closing word from you. Um, thank you very much, Joshua.